Hi, I'm retired NYPD Detective Vic Ferrari, and welcome to NYPD Through the Looking Glass podcast, where you get unique insight into the New York City Police Department. Before we get started, I encourage you to check out my Amazon author page, where you'll find my series of behind-the-scenes NYPD books. The $10 paperback, $2.99 ebook download, including my latest and greatest, NYPD Laughing in the Line of Duty, which is filled with a lot of funny stories. Got a lot to get to today. I'm going to start with the crime pages from the New York Post, which <laughs> always provides enough content. Now, I had commented on this story earlier. Federal authorities believe the migrant, illegal alien, TikTok influencer who became a social media sensation for encouraging others to squat in U.S. homes was a sergeant in Venezuela's military intelligence unit before he illegally entered the country, a federal source told the Post. Lorenzo Marino, who went viral for bragging about all the money he was making in government benefits, was arrested by, by ICE officials in March for skipping out on terms of his probation. This little son of a bitch. I don't know if you guys remember, he was all over the place. He got millions of hits on TikTok, just basically educating these illegal aliens in Spanish who had access to the Internet that go into these houses that don't look where anyone's living and they, they can't throw you out. Look at all the money I'm making. And I think that it, later on in the story it mentions there were photos of him in a gun shop. And I don't know if he purchased a gun or he was handling a gun, but that's a big no-no for someone, an illegal alien in, in the country. So hopefully this guy serves some jail time and then they send him back to Venezuela. I don't know if we have an extradition treaty with Venezuela, but we certainly don't want him here. Now, this story is actually pretty funny. An inmate who shimmied out of handcuffs and escaped from Bellevue Hospital last month was caught riding a bus just two miles from his daring getaway. Sometimes you just want to go home. James M Massetti, 35 years old, was on the lam since June 26th and was picked up around 1.45 p.m. Tuesday while riding an MTA, B MTA bus on West 50th Street and 8th Avenue in Hell's Kitchen. I mean, Bellevue Hospital, I, I, I should actually do an episode on Bellevue Hospital. Bellevue, obviously, is a large hospital. It's a great hospital. They have the morgue, or they used to have the morgue there, and then they have a large psychiatric wing, I, and I could go into what goes on in that psychiatric wing. When you go to any psychiatric wing, and it's a little nerve-wracking for a cop because you basically got to leave, all, when you go to intake, you got to leave all your weapons behind, your gun, your mace, nightstick, because they're afraid if one of these people get their hands on it, they're, they're going to club you to death or kill you. So there's a lot can go wrong in Bellevue. Um, I'll go into it another time. There was a rookie female cop from my precinct that was in there guarding a prisoner, and the guy wanted to use the bathroom, and she uncuffed him, and unfortunately, he got her gun out of her holster, and killed himself. And thank God that that's all he did. I'll, I'll go into that in another episode. Okay, five-year-old boy who dies after cops find him foaming in the mouth in a Bronx apartment had methadone in his system. The deadly drug that Daniil Timberlake is believed to have ingested over the weekend likely came from his father, Daryl Timberlake, a 42-year-old methadone user and a long history of child neglect cases, said NYPD chief of detectives. The, el the elder Timberlake has not been charged in his son's death. Okay, so this is typical of the Bronx District Attorney's Office. He's going to be charged in his son's death. But they want to get all their ducks in a row. They want to talk to the counselor. I mean, this is an open and shut. Kids got methadone in the system. The father's got methadone in the house. It it's and, and they say he's got a long history of child neglect. But they want to get all their ducks in a row. So it's going to take a little bit of time before this guy goes to jail. But mark my words, if it was a cop that fixed a parking ticket like they had that scandal a couple of years ago up in the Bronx, they would have been all over it and someone would have been arrested. Strap hammers, <laughs> strap, strap hangers could see weapon scanners in the subway next few days, Eric Adams said, as officials touted a dip in crime in the city's beleaguered transit system. There's no dip in crime. I can absolutely guarantee you they're fudging the numbers. The soon-to-be pilot program, which the mayor unveiled during a March event in which he demonstrated a freestanding firearm detecting scanner manufactured by Evolve. I'm a little torn about this. Um, I get a little weirded out when I go through the airport now and they're running me through the TSA and I got to go through a body scanner. I mean, look, if you're traveling a lot or you're taking the subway, out, I'm sure these devices emit some form of radiation. And I mean, like... I got to go for a chest x-ray every year from the World Trade Center screening, and I do it, but I'm always nervous about the amount of radiation that my body is exposed to. So, and, you know, and then it boils down to also, 
an illegal search and seizure. The ACLU will be all over this, so we'll see what happens with this. Now, this is a weird story. The jumper who leaped to his death from a luxury hotel in Midtown this week has been identified as, an, as the wealthy co-owner of a movie film firm called Fandango and was a philanthropist who advocated for the protection of tigers, <laughs> sources said Wednesday. Michael Klein, a 64-year-old serial entrepreneur and the father of six with a home in Greenwich, Connecticut, that's big money, plunged from the 20th floor of the Kimberley Hotel and landed in the third floor courtyard Tuesday morning. I mean, this goes to you can have all the money in the world and still be unhappy. Guy's got six kids. He's wealthy. You know, he's never going to have to want for anything, and he's still not happy. And unfortunately, you know, mental illness is a real thing. Something tormented this poor guy and decided to take his own life. So in light of last Saturday's assassination attempt on President Trump, I'd like to point out some things and share my experiences with doing dignitary protection and my experiences with the United States Secret Service, who, by the way, I think is a fine organization. And I think it's fairly obvious from where the shooter fired from should have never been left open. The excuse that it was a sloped roof, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And if you watch the video of the Secret Service snipers that take out the gunman, they're on a sloped roof. So that dog don't hunt, I'm really, I'm kind of skeptical about that. It also kills me to say this, but the A-team wasn't protecting President Trump around him. Uh, you look at that video, the president is 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, there shouldn't have been anybody on that stage or near him that wasn't well over six feet tall. And I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be sexist, but when the shit hit the fan, those female agents look lost. From There was a couple of them yelling on that mic that said, where are we going or what are we doing next? But I definitely heard, where are we going? Then there was one that was unable to holster her weapon. And then there was another one who was more concerned just before they got him in, in the, the motorcade to get him out of there. You had one female agent who's fiddling around with her sunglasses. Go to Sunglass Hut. hut. I mean, you, you're worried about your sunglasses? The president's life is at stake. So there was definitely a lack of training and experience from those agents on the ground. Another thing that I found disturbing was after the shots rung, ring out, President gets down behind the podium. The agent starts surrounding him. It's obvious it's assassination attempt. The amount of time it took to get him off that stage. Now, I get he wanted to put his shoes back on. I get that he wanted to pump his fist to the crowd and let everybody know he was okay. It took entirely too long. If there was a secondary gunman in that crowd or another sniper, multiple people would have been killed, including the president. It just took entirely too much time to get him off there now if you think i'm being too critical about the secret service i'm old enough to remember it was 1980 or 1981 president reagan's in his first term and there's an assassination attempt on him and the guy that tried killing him was a guy by the name of john hinckley he shot president reagan and he uh he wounded this guy james brady who shot he i think he took a gunshot to the head and he was never the same again but I went on YouTube preparing for this podcast, and I wanted to watch the differences on how the agents reacted. First thing I, I, I watching that video, which is nowhere near as long as the assassination attempt on, on President Trump on Saturday, was the age of the agents. All those agents were in their late 30s to their 50s, and they looked battle-hardened, grizzled veterans, and they were not nervous. They weren't jumping around. They looked exactly knew exactly what they were doing. It looked like a, fi a fine, well-oiled machine the way that went down. And if you watch that video, the closest um, Secret Service agents to the gunman immediately charge him and neutralize the threat. Then you got two or three guys pick up Ronald Reagan, who's been shot, and they throw him into the presidential limo, or the beast as it's called, and they were out of there in seconds. I mean, go on YouTube and watch that assassination attempt. It took from the, from the gunshot till the time you see that limo pulling off the block, 11 seconds. And that's, that's a lack of training. That's a lack of preparedness. Someone definitely dropped the ball with the advance team. The advance team should have saw that roof and said, okay, we've got to have cops up there or have that building secured from the night before. Um, God forbid the shit hits the fan on the stage. It looked like there was a bottleneck getting him off the stage, and then they were screwing around by the car for a while. I don't know if that car was blocked in. It's just it, it was a bad scene. So I hate to say this, but the agents involved in the 1981 assassination attempt 
on Ronald Reagan were clearly better trained agents than, than the ones around President Trump on Saturday. And I'm sure I'm, they're going to look back on this film and training in the Secret Service, and I'm sure they did after the 1981 assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan. I'm sure they broke down the film, they watched it, and as well as that went, I mean, it didn't go well. Obviously, John Hinckley was able to get close enough to take a shot at him. But as well as it went, they were able to neutralize him and get the president out of there. I'm sure they still critiqued a lot of those agents back then. It's almost like playing for Bill Belichick after you win the Super Bowl. You missed a block here, but we won the Super Bowl. You still missed a block, and somebody could have gotten really hurt. So, you know... So, thank God everything went well. I, I still think the Secret Service is a great organization, and I'm going to get into that. And if you want to know more about the Secret Service, uh, look on my uh, on my podcast on YouTube or wherever you listen to my podcast. I did an interview with a Secret Service agent turned author. This guy, he's still active as the last time I spoke to him about a year ago, Mark Bradenberg, for a better perspective about the Secret Service. It's on my YouTube uh, channel, but I'm not going to call the guy now. I'm sure he's not taking calls. I'm sure everybody's asking him questions, and I'm sure there's a lot he can't say. So I want, as a member of the New York City Police Department, I went through the Dignitary Protection School, and I worked on security details with the Secret Service and members of the State Department security detail. So I kind of wanted to go into it, the training and how it works. I, I'm nowhere near or a claim to be an expert in this. But I got close enough to it that I kind of see how, how things work. So as a uniform member of the New York City Police Department, at some point in your career and multiple times, you're going to work a presidential detail. And you're basically, you're like an extra in a movie. So what's going to happen is at your precinct, the president's coming to town the day or two before, you're going to get a notification, um, you and several cops and probably a sergeant from your precinct you're going to have to meet somewhere either around JFK or usually there's a ton of cops. The, the president stays at the Waldorf story in Midtown. So what happens is you're going to get a post. So the, say the president's not coming until four o'clock, 11, probably by 11 noon, the latest you get there. There's going to be hundreds, if not thousands of cops, and they're going to line you up all around the route into, into the hotel, around the hotel. There's going to be wooden barriers all over the place. Once that, once the president, once that plane lands, they call it wheels up and wheels down. Once Air Force One touches down, that area is basically starts getting shut down. And when he's on his way, it's shut down. They don't chance anything. And that presidential motorcade, which is Secret Service, um, our emergency service unit with the big guns, multiple units from um, the highway units provide the um, the escort. They cut off streets, so the president. It's, it's called a, um, a moving blockade or a moving roadblock, and they just keep going and cutting off streets, and so the limo can just fly through as quickly as possible. So for cops, when you get that uniform detail around the Waldorf, it's a boring day. You're there. It, it's definitely going to be overtime, but you're on your feet all day. You can't disappear anywhere, and when you're expected to really be out there and, and they tell you face the crowd, you better face that crowd. And you're out there in all sorts of weather. I, I've been out there where it's, it's, it's raining and, or cold, and they're on your ass, but I get it. It's the President of the United States, and they want to make sure he's safe. But I despise the assignment so much that when dignitary – later in my career when I'm a detective and I'm working in organized crime – they started offering this dignitary protection course. And I got to admit, I was never a fan of training. I would pull all sorts of stunts to get out of training. And when this dignitary protection course would come up, up, guys in my office would take the course, and then they would disappear for days at a time, suit and tie, and then they would come back and tell stories about meeting the president. I met this guy, I met that guy. I really had no interest in it. But probably by the time my career was winding down in my 17th or 18th year, I saw the amount of overtime these guys were making doing this dignitary protection. So I said, why not? And I said, it's, it's, I don't remember if the course was a week or two weeks. I want to say two weeks, but I'm not, I really don't remember. But I said, oh, God, I'm going to have to sit in a classroom. And that's another thing. The NYPD does not have its best and brightest doing training. It's usually some inside person, house mouse, that's been hiding in the bowels of one police plaza, and they give them this assignment to do whatever training they're going to they're gonna ram down your throat. And it's people that, that never put it to practicality themselves. I remember after 9-11, I took a terrorism training course, 
And there was a female cop that explained that an IED, an improvised explosive device, can travel 60,000 feet, which is 11 miles. So once you say something like that, I'm going to write you off as an idiot. And just a lot of the training in the NYPD is ridiculous, and it's not done by the best and brightest. But the dignitary protection course was a lot, was nothing that I had expected. It was professional. It was very informative. We watched really interesting training videos. They broke down the film almost like football. They break down plays. They took us out to the range at Rodman's Neck where they have like a little city set up with a bus stop and buildings. And we did dignitary protection. We had a protectee in a car. We rolled up. We got out. We faced different directions. We followed the guy into a building. So it was very hands-on training, and I found it very interesting. So I, And one of the things I'll never forget about that Dignitary Protection course, and again, it was one of the best ones I took, was they were showing us you know, someone that was looking to kill somebody that, that was all in. And they showed us a photo, and it's a picture of a guy on an airplane, and the guy is facing his wife. His wife is standing in the aisle, and she's taking a photo. They're going on vacation somewhere. And I'll never forget, the guy had a mustache and glasses. And he's smiling at his wife in the photo. And sitting right next to him is Mohammed Atta, who was one of the guys that piloted a plane into the World Trade Center. And Atta is just sitting there like this. And, and it was an eerie photo, but it just showed Atta must have been doing a trial run on the plane. They, they were getting their act together, getting ready for 9-11. And he was all in, just totally focused. So they kind of try to teach us body language and things like that, which I found fascinating. And guys, I'm not going to give up any secrets, but you know, I'll, I'll basically walk you through how this works. So it starts like this, the mysterious notification. So great, you got your dignitary protection course under your belt, and that's it. You don't, you don't hear another thing about it. Months later, your administrative lieutenant or sergeant He's going to come up to you. He's going to hand you a notification. And it says, Ferrari, dignitary protection. 0500 or 0600 hours at 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. Go to the BAT. The Brooklyn, uh, uh, Brooklyn, the BAT, which is the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So, and a lot of times you're not going with your partner. That's all you get. You don't know who you're protecting. You don't know who you're working with. That's it. It's very secretive. Next day, you get up at 4 in the morning, shower, shave, suit and tie. I lived in the Bronx. It was a hike. Drive all the way out to the asshole end of Brooklyn. It's in a big industrial park. You park your car. I'm looking at this piece of paper. I'm looking at the buildings. It's a, one building looks, it's all these warehouses that they renovated. And one building looks like the next. Actually, you have the um, a, a federal detention center out there. So you, you walk up. And there's guys on forklifts moving fabric around. It, it looks nothing like a police facility. You get buzzed in through a camera downstairs. You go upstairs. You show your ID. They buzz you into this building. And you walk in, and it, it's a police facility. And there's a big grease board, whiteboard, and it says, for argument's sake, Ferrari, Ryan, Ferrari Auto Crime Division, Ryan, uh, Public uh, Vi Vice Unit, and then it has the protectee's name and the agents that you're going to be working with. So they'll probably be the Ryan from Vice comes over and he shakes your hand. He goes, hi, I'm, I'm Tommy Ryan. I work in Queens South Vice. Hey, Ferrari, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes you work with guys in unit, but a lot of times you don't. Sergeant hands you like an accordion folder. And in the accordion folder is going to be a police radio, set of keys to an unmarked car that's downstairs. And you're going to have the protectee's name his itinerary, and the agents you're going to be working with. So if memory serves me correctly, if it's a foreign head of state, the Secret Service is running the show. If it's the second banana of a country or an ambassador, the State Department runs the security detail. So someone's already watching this guy at a Manhattan hotel. There's already two, a bunch of people watching this guy at a Manhattan hotel. So once you get your assignment, you and your partner leave, one guy drives, the other guy gets on his cell phone, and the first thing you do is you call the Secret Service agent, the liaison, or the State Department guy, and you go, hey, this is Ferrari, uh, Detective Ferrari from the Auto Crime Division. We're coming in. Uh, you're at the Pierre Hotel. Yeah, 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 just park on West something street, and I'll meet you out front. You meet with the agents. You relieve your NYPD counterparts that have been supplementing the agents, and basically you serve as the pleasure 
of the protectee. And a lot of times the protectee is going to the UN, they're giving a speech, they're going to fundraisers, and depending on the country and the threat level, I've been with guys where it's just myself, another detective, and, and a couple of Secret Service agents or a couple of guys from the State Department, and you bounce. If this guy wants to go to lunch here, you go there. And some of this stuff is absolutely absurd because a lot of these people, these foreign dignitaries, take advantage. And I'll share a couple of stories with you. So the first time I do dignitary protection, we're protecting, I don't remember if it was the president of Slovenia, it was a big shot from Slovenia. And he got up first thing in the morning, he was catching a flight out of JFK back to Slovenia, and he insisted that we stop at Barney's. Now, Barney's is a very expensive clothing store in Manhattan. The guy was there an hour shopping while we followed him around through Barney's, and he spent $20,000 on hand-painted ties and a suit. Another time, we were tasked with, we, we meet this guy, we meet this, um, he was a prime minister of one of the Caribbean islands, right? And it's him and his little group. It's his wife and his pregnant girlfriend, right? He gets them, I don't know how they got on the plane without beating the crap out of each other, but it was like one big happy family. They get off the plane. We get them set up in a hotel. He wants to go to Brooklyn. He owns buildings in Brooklyn. So we had to go with <laughs> this prime minister of a, a Caribbean island while he dealt with the super of the building and collected rents. I mean, if you can believe that, I know it sounds ridiculous, but these people definitely take advantage of things that go on. Another time, Benjamin Netanyahu, he was prime minister of Israel, then he wasn't. And when he wasn't, he came back to the United States and myself and another NYP detective were tasked to guard him with two members of the Shin Bet. And the Shin Bet is the Israeli Secret Service. And we went to a restaurant, and I'll never forget Netanyahu said, guys, we were sitting in the next table, and he goes, listen, lunch is on me. Order whatever you want. Just don't, don't get a salad. So I, I, you know, considering what I just told you about how these people use us, you know, he wanted to buy us lunch. And we're sitting there with these two young guys, and these Israeli guys were no joke. I mean, they were commandos in suits, and they were telling us how everybody in Israel has to serve in the military. One guy was a, um, one guy was a commando. The other guy was a, a tank operator. And basically what his assignment was, was after they figured out a, who a suicide bomber's family was, I guess over in the West Bank, they would go there with a tank and knock down the guy's house the family's house, and then he was telling stories how he's on the rubble of this building that he just knocked over, and then you've got people throwing Molotov cocktails, and, the, and the, the tank is in flames, and it's getting really hot in there, and, you know, he didn't think he'd escape. So, and these guys were no joke. I mean, they carry guns, and, you know, they're totally dedicated to, to protect their target. So we, I found that really interesting. So when I started doing the dignitary protection, I loved it. Then I couldn't get enough of it because, A, you, you got at least four hours because you're getting there, you're getting there, your, your tour starts at like 6 a.m. You, you usually work four, five, six hours over, sometimes more, depending, depending on the individual. And, you know, that, that helped me. <laughs> that helped me in, in retirement. So I and I had some preconceived notions about the Secret Service. I mean, I watched movies and stuff. I knew nothing about the Secret Service before I did the dignitary protection. And I have to tell you, I was impressed. I mean, I've worked with a lot of federal agencies during the course of my NYPD career, and I found the Secret Service to be first rate and professional. You know, they bent over backwards to be helpful. They didn't have an attitude. Um, just down to earth, you know, guys that dealt with the supervisors, the field agents. And I, and I met a lot of interesting ones. One guy actually, um, he was on, I don't know what he was doing in New York, but he was on um, Ronald Reagan's protective detail while he was alive, while, while Reagan was terminally ill. And it, it was pretty interesting stuff. Another one told me that um, he was on Gerald Ford's protected, uh, he, he protected Gerald Ford in retirement. And he said, Gerald Ford never spent a dime. And I go, what do you mean he never spent a dime? He goes, he will pay for everything with a check. I go, what do you mean he pays for everything with a check? He goes, if he goes into a restaurant, he, he, he writes a check. He goes, oh, will you take a check? Sure, of course, President Ford, I'll take a check. Because he knows no one's going to cash that check. 
because it's got his signature on it and it's from Gerald Ford. It's actually an ingenious scam. And if I ever become famous, I would pay for everything in a check too. I found that to be a very <laughs> interesting. So like I said, I had some preconceived notions about the Secret Service, but first rate organization. But unfortunately, from what I saw on Saturday, it definitely looked like there was some deep. The DEI hires, including those at the top, and it failed. And, you know, I, I just hope they get their act straightened out over there because, I mean, no matter what your political affiliation, this is our country, and, and it's important we keep the president and his family safe. So I, I really hope they get that straightened out. So enough of that. On a side note, I came across this story, and it's an interesting one, and... There was a woman in 1996, her name was Karina Homer. She was a Swedish au pair who, after a night out with friends, was found murdered in the Boston Dinner Theater District in 1996. Her remains were discovered in a dumpster, and a partial fingerprint, possibly linked to the killer, was lifted. To date, there's not been an arrest in the case, and I encourage you to check out this website, where you, if you know anything in the Boston area about this murder, Please go to Who Killed Karina, K A R I N A, Homer, H O L M E R dot com. And if you have any tips or, or information, I, I encourage you to check it out. So, to lighten the mood, I've invited my 26 month old Irish wolfhound puppy, who was the most destructive of all my Irish wolfhounds, including tearing a hole in my box spring mattress. Come here, Shelfie. So, as you can see, let's see if I can get her in the camera. Chelsea is 26 months old. She's 47 pounds. She weighs 47 pounds. Let me see if I can get a closer close-up of her. This is why I don't work with animals or kids. Chelsea, come here. So here's Chelsea. I love her to death. A pain in my ass, but she's a good dog. All right, so I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in, including my friends in Brooklyn, New York, Denver, Colorado, Deerfield Beach, Florida. That's home to boxing promoter Don King. Sydney, South Wales, Christchurch, Canterbury, and do you know the way to San Jose, California? I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in, and I'll have another episode next week. Oh, no, no, and, and wait up. And be sure to check out my Amazon author page. Type in my name, Vic Ferrari, like the call, where you can preview all my books for free, including my latest and greatest NYPD laughing in the line of duty. Thanks again, and have a great weekend.